Welcome to the web version of the Parents Education Partnership presentation on Social Networking 101. My name is Trevor Shaw. I'm the Director of Technology at the Dwight Englewood School, and I gave this presentation live on December 2nd, 2011 at the Dwight Englewood School in Englewood, New Jersey. In this video, I'm going to recap some of the highlights of the presentation and point you to some of the online resources that we used in the workshop that day. I'd like to use this question to focus our thinking on how our kids approach their privacy online. When Dana Boyd was with us last spring, she, showed, she spoke about kids' online behavior as identity construction, and I think that's a key point in understanding why kids do some of the things that they do online. So as we move through this discussion, let's keep this question in mind. How do kids build identity online, and how does the online experience and aid, and aid them in the construction process? For those of you that weren't able to make it to hear Dana Boyd last year, let me give you a brief recap. In case you aren't familiar with her work, she spent about six years traveling around the country interviewing teens about how they use the internet and social media. From these conversations, she identified patterns and themes that emerged. There were three things in particular that she said last year that really struck me, and I want to use these three things to frame what I'm going to talk about today. The first of these points is the notion of social grooming. You've probably all seen this if you've ever looked over your child's shoulder while he or she is on the computer. I remember one time I looked at the screen while my son was on Facebook and a classmate had sent him an instant message. She said, sup? He replies, nothing. And this goes back and forth for about two or three minutes without much at all being said. So what is this? What are they doing? Boyd points out that this is a way of reinforcing one's connection to the community. It's a way of reinforcing social ties that connect the entire community. And what's interesting to me about it is that these kids aren't just benefiting from these connections, they're actually helping to build them. The next point that I felt was key is the idea of online activities being a form of identity construction. In many ways, kids are engaged in the building of their own brand. Two metaphors that Boyd used, which I think were dead on, are the idea of a kid's Facebook wall being the equivalent of her bedroom wall or locker door. Think about the types of things that kids hang in their walls, in their rooms. It's a way of demonstrating to others, this is who I am. These are the things I value. This is how I want others to see me. Then later, when they get tired of it, they can take it all down and start over in a completely different direction. The final point that Boyd made last year is the concept of online social communities as what she calls networked publics. In the real world, publics are a place where you go specifically to be seen and to participate in things in a very public way. Think of the mall or a park or the local hangout. When kids get together online, these social media take on the role that these publics serve in the real world. The identity or brand that a child has cultivated for himself now plays a very important role in that online networked public. When we think about kids using social media in this way, some of the behavior doesn't seem so strange anymore. I can remember when we used to be so shocked when kids would post something personal or private about themselves online in Facebook or MySpace in a public way. I can remember thinking, kids must just not care about their privacy. It seemed really hard to reconcile that point of view with the reactions we would sometimes see if a parent or teacher accessed that MySpace or Facebook page and confronted the kid about it. Even if it was public, the kid would often be incensed that an adult in their life would pry into their personal life in that way. If we think about a teen's online world, though, as similar to the mall, where they might hang out with friends at the food court and engage in a conversation in a very public place, this reaction makes a little more sense. Those kids would be furious if they looked over to a nearby booth and found a teacher or parent eavesdropping on their conversation, even though it was happening in a public place. This quote from Dana Boyd, I think, frames the issue really nicely. If the act of being in a public is, for all intents and purposes, a performance, then whom you're performing for matters a great deal. Think for a moment about the different groups that you relate to in your life. You probably have friends that you socialize with, you probably have family that you see around the holidays, and you probably have people that you work with. Each of these groups demands a slightly different level of behavior from us. We vary our language, our dress, and behavior depending on whom we're with and what, so what the social situation demands. In the real world, we know where we are and, with, and whom we're with. In the real world, we're usually with only one of these groups at a time. In the real world, you know how each of these groups expects you to behave. A fancy word for these behavioral expectations is social norms. These are incredibly powerful forces that dictate behavior. Unlike laws, social norms are implicit, unwritten. In fact, 
There are many cases where social norms are in direct conflict to the written law. Think of the 55 mile an hour speed limit on the highway. This quote from the recent Pew Center report on Internet and the American Life illustrates one of the challenges related to social norms and online communities. If your Facebook community contains several social circles with very different social norms, how can you tell what social norms you need to conform to when you want to post a photo or a comment? So let's think for a minute about what these audiences look like. If you're anything like me, your Facebook social network probably looks something like this. You probably have Facebook friends from very different periods in your life who've all found you in the last few years. Also, if you're anything like me, you're probably a very different person now than you were in high school, college, or at your first job. So that can be kind of strange sometimes, since social norms that govern those relationships 20 or 30 years ago are what people remember, but almost nobody's really the same person. Also interesting is the way that you can delineate these audiences. I drew out the boundaries in the most obvious way, but other boundaries could also be drawn. You probably all have a liberal and conservative friend group. That can be fun around election time. You might also be able to draw the boundaries around things like ethnicity, sexuality, native language, or other characteristics that might define as social norms in a group. Now let's look at kids' audiences. Unlike us, they're not going to have friends from 30 or 40 years ago, but they'll almost certainly have groups within very, with very strict social norms. These groups might break down along gender lines, but I bet if you think back to when you were in high school, you'll remember the various other groups, each with its own set of social norms. So if we think back to Dana Boyd's point about online social behavior as identity creation, we can begin to understand the challenges that a kid faces when he tries to par participate in a social network. Kids are constantly building that brand, but they're dealing with multiple audiences that they can't really see. Imagine for a moment that you're 15 years old again, with all the issues that go along with being 15, all the insecurities, all the impulsivity, the lack of a filter for what you sometimes say. Imagine that you have to walk into the high school cafeteria and engage people in conversation. Remember, you're building your brand, your rep. You're trying to show people who you are while, sim while simultaneously trying to figure that out for yourself. Except this isn't the real world where you can see everyone. This is the online world. So imagine that you have to do this blindfolded. You have to sit down at a table and begin sharing. When you put something out there about yourself, you have no idea if you're sitting with the football team, the chess club, or the drama guild. You have no idea who's sitting right behind you and might overhear your conversation or begin participating in it. All those groups, each with slightly different social norms. This seems pretty stressful to me. Kind of makes me glad that we didn't have Facebook when I was in high school. So why not throw another wrinkle into the mix? When you friend your kids, you get several other layers of audiences participating in these network publics. And this creates lots of new and bizarre ways to violate the social norms of these groups. Let me give you an example. I was looking at the Facebook account of a sixth grader that I know. One of his sixth grade friends posted a picture of a swimsuit model in kind of a sexy pose. There were lots of comments on the photo. The first comments were from other sixth grade boys and they basically sounded like what you would expect from sixth grade boys. Whoa, she's really hot, I love you, all that kind of stuff. But the photo was posted in such a way that the friends of friends could see it and commented on it. What I can only assume was the older brother or cousin of one of these sixth graders began to add some comments of his own. And this person was late teens or early 20s. His comments reflected what you might expect to hear at a frat house. So think for a minute about the different ways that social norms got warped in this example. By posting and commenting on the picture in the first place, the younger boys had no idea that it would be seen by an adult. So the norms that govern how an 11-year-old is supposed to interact with teachers, parents, and other adults has been violated. Then, by adding some explicit comments to the picture, the older boys have really twisted the rules that govern how 20 something should be interacting with 11-year-olds, especially with their parents watching. So one reaction to all of this is to simply say, don't friend your kids on Facebook, or you should try and scare them into not participating in social networks at all for fear of being misunderstood by future employers or college admissions people. Personally, I think the second solution is woefully naive the first solution also discards the most powerful tool that you have in your attempts to help kids navigate the online world. The social networking guru Will Richardson is fond of saying that his greatest fear is not that one day an employer will some find something embarrassing about one of his children online, 
but rather that one day a potential employer, college admissions rep, or future spouse might Google one of his children and not find anything at all. If we're going to be judged to some extent by what we post online, it seems like we're only doing half the job by trying not to post anything embarrassing. So then, how can we as adults help our kids work their way through this mess? I think the solution comes in two parts. The first part is raising awareness. Kids are often walking through these online communities trying to imagine what their audiences look like. They're totally oblivious to the fact that these audiences are so varied, overlapping, and bumping into each other. They also don't always explicitly understand the differences in social norms that exist in these groups. But that isn't to say that they don't understand them intuitively, though. They just need help thinking about them explicitly. Dana Boyd would argue, I think, that we need to prompt kids to be more reflective about their online presence with questions that are meant to challenge, but not to shame or scare kids. In our middle school, we like to say that you should never post anything online you wouldn't want your grandmother to see. I like this grandmother effect. It can be pretty cool and powerful. Imagine the reaction of the high school student who posts pictures of his latest antics at a recent party to Facebook. Imagine that student's grandmother then pulling him aside when she sees him at Thanksgiving and saying something like, hey, I saw your pictures on Facebook. The ones of your hiking trip looked amazing, but I gotta tell you, I didn't much like the ones of you at that party. It looked like you were pretty out of control and didn't have much respect for yourself. Is that the message you were trying to send? The grandmother doesn't have to scold or shame the kid. With some very straightforward questions, she's able to leverage the incredible power that these social norms have over us and cause the kid to reflect on how he has presented his image inappropriately to an audience whose expectations he is pretty badly misjudged. The second part of the solution is giving kids the tools and training they need to, control, to take control of their information once they've gained this awareness. Remember, they want to have that conversation at the food court at the mall but they need to control the boundaries of that conversation. Most social networking sites give users the power to do this, but the default settings are not always the ones that users would choose for themselves. Kids and adults often don't think about these settings until a problem has happened related to privacy online. When I gave this presentation live, at this point we divided up into groups and actually walked through the security settings in Facebook. I went through and designed and recommended configurations of privacy settings and asked each group to configure them on the Facebook account of one person in their group. These settings are completely my own recommendations. Individual people might find them too liberal or too restrictive, and as the groups worked, they talked about the implications of some of the settings. The settings do, however, represent a good starting point for helping you and your child take control of your information online. It's also worth pointing out that while these settings are specific to Facebook, the general concepts behind them can be applied to nearly any type of social media. To access the handouts that include the list of recommended privacy settings, you can go to http colon slash slash tinyurl.com slash 6UNBDL8. Thanks for watching. For more information on this or any other Parent Education Partnership presentations, please visit the PEP section of the Dwight Englewood website at www.d-e.org slash pep.